Sameach Sukkot. This week's, or I should say today's portion is for Sukkot, the Feast of Booths and Tabernacles. It's from Leviticus 23, 33 through 36. Numbers 29, 12. Zechariah 14, 1 through 21. And Revelation 7, 1 through 10. The introduction. Sukkot, the time of our gladness, is the third in the cycle of pilgrimage festivals. On Passover, we celebrate our redemption from Egypt and our freedom from physical bondage. Shavuot commemorates the giving of the Torah, whereby we gained our spiritual freedom by learning what the Almighty considered to be sin. With Sukkot, the cycle reaches its culmination in an exhilarating outburst of joy and wealth of symbols that evoke memories of divine protection in the past that lift our present to a higher spiritual plateau and that point the way to the Messianic future. Leviticus 23, 41 through 44. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generation. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feast of the Lord. And it says in there, of course, it is a statute forever throughout your generation. The Hebrew word forever in there is one that you've heard before. It's olam. And the definition for it is very simple. Long duration, antiquity, and futurity. In other words, it's talking about it goes all the way back in ancient times, and it goes all the way through to the future. In other words, it never ends. It has no beginning and it has no end. And God also defines it as a statue. The Hebrew word here is chukah. Chukah means something prescribed. An enactment, a statue. Sukkot is the second from the last of the fall festivals and one that many focus on because it's specifically mentioned as one that will be kept during the Messianic age. The importance of it can be seen in the fact that it is referred to as a statute forever throughout your generation. The Hebrew word for statute is chukah and it means something prescribed, an enactment or a statute. A statute is something that is part of the Torah because we are told the Torah contains precepts, commandments, judgments, and statutes. So the Torah is more than just a compendium of teachings. It has more to it than we understand, and yet everything that's in there can be considered to be teachings or instructions. But God puts them into categories, and he defines them. He calls them, some of them are precepts, some of them are commandments, some are judgments, and some are statutes. Today, in Judaism, they call everything commandments. They call it all, instead of breaking them down into the categories that they are. Their rationale behind it is, is that if God said it, no matter what you want to describe it as, then it has to be it's a command from God that God gives you. The thing about it is, is that Judaism at times... They do things that they say is a commandment from God that actually isn't. We do the blessing over the shofar. We say that God commanded us to do that. There is no commandment about blowing the shofar. There's no commandment for it whatsoever. Okay? Why do we do it? Because we're trying to be in sync with what our Jewish brethren are doing. And to give them a place that they come in here that's something, you know, that they can feel that, hey, wow, this is not that different from where we came from. In fact, is some of them may believe that, boy, you are different from where you came from because you're more observant than we were. We've had that happen before in the past. And you know, we had some, a couple come from Israel one time. They were visiting here and they saw the sign outside. And they stopped in and they looked around here and they saw what we were doing and their comment was is that, you're more observant than we are. So that kind of tells you where they were coming from. So living in the land of Israel didn't mean that they were doing what God had told them to do. 
The only reason that they were in the land is because God allows them to be in the land. Because God wants them in the land. God wants them in the land because God basically, you know, in my, one of my beliefs are is that God put them in the land to be a sore in the side of the rest of the nations on the face of the earth. That it's kind of, look at this little country. You put it on a map and it disappears. You can't define it unless you blow up that whole area. And then you look at what it's surrounded by. And you see all these Islamic countries surrounding it all over the place. And you look at, where's Israel? Where's little Israel that's in there? And it survived. It's there. I think what God is trying to say is that look how small this country is right now, but they live on. They live on because I want them to live on. I want them to be there. And one of these days, hopefully, that more of my Jewish brethren will begin to see that God has his hand on them and that they need the Messiah. Amen. Yes. There are Jews who talk about the Messiah, but they're still waiting for him. We already know that he's come at least once. So instead of them looking for the first coming of the Messiah, they're looking at the second coming of the Messiah, but for them, it's going to be the first coming. It becomes a bit confusing after a while when you do that, but hey, the more you think about it, the more it becomes like the same every day, the same thing that you come over and over and over again. Sukkot was given to remind Israel of how their ancestors had dwelt in booths during the 40 years that they spent wandering in the wilderness. It is also a time to reflect on the future and how we will dwell with the Messiah. Yeshua for 1,000 years during the Messianic Age. Be interesting. What if he told us during the 1,000 years of the Messianic Age? Hey guys, there's your tent. Go for it. You don't know. You don't know. Why would he put the emphasis that Sukkot is going to be celebrated during the Messianic Kingdom? He doesn't mention the other festivals. But he mentions Sukkot specifically. He can't put away the other festivals because the same command that goes along with Sukkot goes along with those festivals forever. They are forever. But the emphasis is put on Sukkot with that. While many disregard the festivals as something that they no longer need as believers in Messiah, they are ignoring some of the Lord's most obvious prophetic signs about his plan. His festivals are a map that take us step by step through his plan from the redemption of his people to our future with him forever in eternity. And so many who say they are believers in Messiah simply turn their back on his festivals to follow holidays that have nothing to do with him according to his Torah and even in the apostolic scriptures. Where does it say that we are to keep Christmas or Easter? Where are we told that we're supposed to do that? Yet if we say anything about the lack of biblical substantiation for these holidays, we are accused of not being real believers. I mean, since when is our salvation based on the fact that you keep a pagan holiday? It's kind of backwards when you think about it. But yet it's the way that God planned things out. He brought confusion, or he allowed confusion to reign supreme, and confusion does reign supreme today. It reigned supreme many years ago, but it's just been building and building and building until it's in our day, it's getting worse and worse and worse. What is a real believer? Isn't a real believer one who has committed themselves to faith in the Son of God, Yeshua? That should be first and foremost. Faith in the Messiah. But that is not the last requirement, if you want to call it that. There's more than that. Isn't a real believer one who follows the path laid out for us in the Messiah, Yeshua? What I'm talking about is the path that he laid out for us called Torah. That's the path that's in Scripture that you can follow from the very beginning all the way down to the very end. Thing is, it's not it's not a linear progression. It's a circular progression. We go around. 
And we come back to where we started from so we can get it right the next time out. The Torah is the one and only written covenant with God's people. There is no other covenant that God has given to His people. He has never done away with that covenant. He has never taken that covenant away and given it to another people. No matter what that people may say to you about that they have a new covenant, I would ask them, how do they define their new covenant? They would probably define their new covenant as all you need to do is believe in Yeshua and love everyone. How do you know what God expects from you if you don't read the Bible and you don't need, read what He tells you to do? Well, usually they're going to tell you, well, we read the New Testament, and all that's all we really need if we read the New Testament, because that tells us everything. I can take them right into the New Testament and show them how it goes right back to the Torah. That the foundation for the New Testament is based in the Torah. You can't get lost there if you follow that because God lays it out. It's like breadcrumbs that he's putting out for us to follow. Sometimes I just wish it would make it more evident to people and take those blinders off of their eyes, not just off of the Jewish people, but off of everyone else so that they can see clearly the road that they're supposed to follow and stop following a road that leads them nowhere. The only way that the the only place that the other road leads you is to hell and damnation. I know some people they don't want to hear that, but if you're not following God's road, what other road can you follow? There's only two. So if you're not following His road, then you're going down the road that's going to lead you to a place that you don't really want to go. It's going to be eternally hot there. For those that God doesn't put back in the air. There's going to be those that God is not even going to wake up from the dead in order to judge them. He's going to leave them buried in the dust of the earth. He tells us that in Daniel 12 too. That many who lie in the dust of the earth or in the dirt, they are not going to be brought back to the earth. So they've been judged. They might be the lucky ones who God just leaves there rather than the ones that he's going to throw into the lake of fire. You know, I heard some people would say, some people told me years ago, and they said, God wouldn't do anything like that to anyone. It's, that's not a merciful God. It's a God who's been warning us for thousands of years what will happen if we veer from his covenant. He's been telling us that. Why would God go back on His covenant just to make us happy? He doesn't care about making us happy. He cares about our, where we're going to wind up spending eternity. Because when you're in eternity, that's the happy place. Outside of eternity is the unhappy place. That's being in the outer darkness where the weeping of the gnashing of teeth take place. That's the sad place, people. Sukkot was given to help us to remember what our ancestors went through. And more importantly, it shows us what the future holds for us. Yes, the Holy One of Israel holds us in the palm of His hand and guides us through life, helping us to find our way in the darkness that is enveloping this world. And the darkness is enveloping the world. Every day we get up, we can look outside. Okay, yeah, hey, the sun came up. Look at that sun, it's really bright today. But is that sun really bright against that darkness that's dropping more and more and more over this world? In Nehemiah chapter 8, starting in verse 14, they found written in the Torah that Adonai had ordered through Moshe that the people of Israel were to live in Sukkot during the feast of the seventh month, that they were to announce and pass the word in all their cities and in Yerushalayim, go out to the mountains and collect branches of olives, wild olives, myrtles, palms, and other leafy trees to make Sukkot as prescribed. So the people went out, brought them, and made Sukkot for themselves, each one on the roof of his house, also in their courtyards, in the courtyards of the house of God, in the open space 
by the water gate, and in the open space by the Ephraim gate. So you look at that and you think about that and this is from the prophet Nehemiah. Nehemiah was one of the returnees from exile in Babylon. He brought back one group of people from that exile, but he wasn't the only one. Ezra also brought back part of the remnant. Ezra was a scribe and a priest of God. Nehemiah served in the royal court in Babylon. Don't know if, I don't believe he was a priest. He was a court official. They were allowed to come back. They were going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. They had some blowback from the locals that were there at the time. So they got an order from the king of Babylon who told them to allow them to rebuild the walls. But then, as they were rebuilding and they were doing the things that they were doing, they discovered a copy of the book of Torah. Interesting, isn't it? After all those years in exile, that they discover a copy of the book of the Torah. And Ezra took that book of Torah, and he called the people together, and he read the entire thing to them in order to proclaim God's word to the people, which means that a lot of the people who were in the Babylonian captivity lost their connection to the covenant that God had given to Israel. But God's covenant is never really lost. It usually finds its way back. When God wants it to be found, it's found. In our day and time, it's finding its way again. As more and more people move away from what God wants them to do, and they start thinking differently, and they think, start approaching God from the way that the world views God, you can't view God in the way that the world views God. You have to view God from how God presents himself to us. He's an unfathomable being. We don't know him. We want to know him. We want to try to get to know him. We pray to him. We ask for his forgiveness. He tells us that we need to approach him through his son, Messiah Yeshua, who's our intermediary, so we do that in trying to make our connection with the Father. And Yeshua says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, but how many of us have seen Yeshua? But yet Yeshua is going to lead the way. It's going to be interesting when he returns. If we're here, when he returns the way that he left. Think about that. You return, how did he leave? He ascended into heaven, from the earth, and he disappeared into the clouds as his disciples were watching him and seeing him. So now he says he's going to return in the same way. I think it's going to be interesting because I think that every single camera on every place is probably going to be pointed up there and looking at him trying to figure out who the heck is this? Is this an alien being from another planet? Have we finally made contact? I think Yeshua is going to say, yeah, you finally made contact because this is probably the first time most of you have ever encountered me. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke, upon, my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jeremiah 6.16, which that is from, says, Thus says the Lord, stand at the crossroads and look, and ask for the ancient paths where the good way lies, and walk in it and find rest for your soul. But they said, we will not walk in it. So the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient past. Ask for the way of Torah. And he says, that's where the good way lies. And he says, walk in that way and find rest for your souls. But yet the response by the majority of the people is, we will not walk in that way. They have condemned themselves. They don't need our help. 
It's up to them in order to be able to figure this out. Our responsibility is we're not put here on this earth to save anybody. It's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to be an example to other people. To live our lives the best way that we can according to the covenant that God gave to us in Torah. Proclaiming our faith in Messiah as the only source of salvation and redemption for them. That there is no redemption in keeping the Torah. We keep the Torah because that's what God commands us to do. Because he says that's what pleases him. So if it pleases him, why wouldn't we want to do that? Why do we make excuses for why we can't follow the Torah? Yes, we can't understand some of the commands that are in the Torah. Some of the teachings that are there. Some of the instructions that are there. But there are ones that we do understand that we should be doing our best to keep. The Messiah quotes from Jeremiah 6.16 and tells us his yoke is easy and his burden is light. There's no confusion about what he's talking about when we read what is written in Jeremiah 6.16. It's a path of Torah. We try our best to walk these ancient paths because they are the foundation on which the universe is built. The universe is built on Torah. The universe is built on the Word of God. Who is the Word of God? Messiah. He's the Word. The universe is built on the three pillars of our faith. Those pillars of our faith are the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when you look in Genesis in the opening chapter, in the opening verses there in the creation process, you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at work. And then you go over and you read in John, and you read in the book of John where everybody tells you that, they always point you when you become a believer, they say, now go read the book of John. Well, if you read the book of John and you understand what the book of John is telling you, you need to go right back to the book of Genesis and you've got to start from the beginning. Not start from the book of John. You need to go back to the very beginning in Genesis where everything starts. Where he tells us what it is. In Numbers 29, 32-34. On the seventh day, seven bulls, two rams, 14 male lambs a year, old without blemish with the grain offering and the drink offerings for the bulls, for the rams, and for the lambs, and the prescribed quantity. Also one male goat for a sin offering, besides the regular burnt offering, its grain offering, and its drink offering. This is the requirement for when they celebrate the festival of Sukkot. All of these animal sacrifices. What does that have to do with any of that? Well, the Lord required them to do that. Once they had a tabernacle and it was constructed, then God required them to do these things. Are we doing them today? No. What is our sacrifice today? Ourselves. We are the sacrifice that we lay down at the altar. Now, this doesn't mean that in Yeshua's day, after he died and was resurrected and he ascended, did his disciples abandon the sacrificial system? We are not told that. In fact, as we're told that they went every single day to the temple in order to be able to share about the teachings of Messiah. We are told that the Apostle Paul himself went to the temple to try to make a sacrifice. He was prevented from doing it. People say that the Apostle Paul changed everything, that he did away with having to follow the Torah, that we didn't have to do it anymore. My question would be, where did Paul get the authority to do that? Okay? And did Paul have that authority to undo what God had done? Would he go against what Messiah had taught? I doubt that. Because if he did, we'd have to take out every single book or letter that he has written in the Bible and do away with it. Because if he's anti-Torah, he shouldn't be in the Bible. But Paul is not anti-Torah. Paul is descended from a line of Pharisees and himself was a Pharisee. He even holds that up as one of his credentials. 
A Pharisee was an observant Jew. A very observant Jew. He even described himself as being the most observant out of all the observant. He was a Jew to the highest level. But in his understanding, it was in all of that education and understanding that he had that at first blinded him to the truth of who Messiah was. But ultimately he came to an understanding of that because he encountered Messiah in a way that the majority of us have never encountered him. Basically, God got right in his face. He got right in his face and he said, What are you doing? And Paul answered, you know, asked him, Well, who are you? Yeshua told him. And he dropped to his knees in repentance before that. And he was blinded for three days. So the Lord removed the scales from his eyes. And then he had to learn all over again. Had to apply what he had learned before in order to be able to reach out. But it always is very humorous to me when I think about the Apostle Paul. And what's humorous to me is this. He was such a learned Jew, you would have thought that he would have been the perfect Apostle to the Jew. But no, God said that he will be the apostle to the Gentiles, to the nations. Because every time he went to the Jews, they rejected him. The majority of the Jews didn't want to hear from him. Why? Because they considered him a turncoat. They said, look at him. Who does he think he is? He's coming to us. So who became the apostle to the Jew? Peter. He becomes the apostle to the Jew. Peter was the first one to encounter taking the message of Messiah to the Gentiles. Why was that so important? Because it would be Peter who would testify on Paul's behalf when he comes before the Jerusalem council in a dispute with the Pharisaical believers who are bringing charges against him about doing away with the Torah. But Peter stands up for him. In Zechariah 14, 3 through 8, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountain for the valley of my mountain shall reach to Azal. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. On that day there shall be no light, cold or frost. And there shall be a unique day which is known to the Lord. Neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. On that day living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the, into the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. In Revelation 16, 16, And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. And Armageddon is a Greek word. In Hebrew, it's actually Har Megiddo, which means Mount of Megiddo, the city of Megiddo, which was an ancient city that existed. So Armageddon is defined as the hill or the city of Megiddo. In Revelation 16, 16, the scene of the struggle of good and evil is suggested by that battle plane of Estrelan, which was famous for two great victories, of Barak over the Canaanites and of Gideon over the Midianites, and for two great disasters, the death of Saul and Josiah. Hence in Revelation, a place of great slaughter the scene of a terrible retribution upon the wicked. The Revised Standard Version of the Bible translates the name as Harmageddo, or as we said just before, the hill, as Ar or Har is the city of Megiddo. 
In Revelation 20, verse 7 and 8, when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, God and Magog, in order to gather them for battle. They are as numerous as the sands of the sea. Ezekiel 38.2 says, Son of man, set your face toward God of the land of Magog, the prince of Roach, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against them. So you see, in the book of Revelation, they're talking about two battles. Everybody always thinks that Armageddon is it. They think that's the one great battle and it takes care of everything. That's only the first one. God and Magog is the big battle. It's the final battle. And you notice that Scripture says when the thousand years are ended, are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth. So the Messianic age comes to an end and then Satan is released again. Does that mean Messiah is gone during that period of time that it takes place? We don't know. We're not told that. But we do know that there's going to be a time that he will be given another opportunity to deceive mankind. In Revelation 14, 3 through 8, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elder. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. And they saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And He said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory. Because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. That will be the end of all things. The 144,000, who are they? They're 12,000 from each of the twelve tribes of Israel. The twelve tribes of Israel. A lot of people today say the 144,000 are all Jews. They're not all Jews. There's 12,000 from each one of the tribes of Israel. So you have 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. They're not Jews, they're Reubenites. You go on and on, so there'll be 12,000 from the tribe of Judah. These will be the witnesses in the last days. These will be the witnesses before the end comes. And God finally deals with mankind and does what is necessary and what He's going to have to do. A lot of it can be speculation on my part. Prophecy can have more than one fulfillment in Scripture. We know that. There are prophecies that have already been fulfilled in Scripture, but... Is that the only fulfillment for that particular prophecy? No, it can come again. Am I going to tell you that these prophecies are going to take place tomorrow? Heck no. I am not going down that road. I am not going to do that. I am not going to be there. People say to me, well, what do you think? What do you think, Rabbi? What do you think, you know, look at things the way they're happening and everything like that. Well, they thought the same thing at World War II. They thought the same thing at World War I. They thought the same blah, 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 and keep on going down the line for that. How many people realize that the United States in its present form of government is actually nearing the end of its lifespan? That previous governments before this, like Rome and Greece and everything, reached the same in the cycle of what they did and where are they today? They're gone. And you look at the way and the things that they did you have to question yourself, are we following in their footsteps instead of God's footsteps? So all I can say is, is that look to the skies, 
and hope it's not a cloudy day. But I don't think clouds are going to matter because when he returns, I think it's going to be a clear... Well, it says he's, he went with the clouds and he disappeared behind the clouds. So he may return behind the clouds and then just burst forth in all of his glory. Burst forth. Just think of that. You'd be looking at your TV seeing this wall of light coming down. It should make you think of the burning bush and it was never consumed. And here comes Messiah coming back. There are going to be some people going, Yay! And there are going to be some people going, Oh boy. And there's going to be a lot of people going, Oy vey. <laughs> and I'm going to close with this. Terror man says, Faith and fear can never exist together. Amen.